One day, while doing our best to avoid the mayor's chores in Grafton, we stumble upon a building that we've never seen before. A pawn shop. How did we miss this? It's on the southern side of town and is easily distinguished from the other buildings as there's a fallen tree leaning against the roof of the pawn shop. Heading inside, we find it empty. But looking down, we see a number of notes that have been pushed under the door. The first is triple nine setback. I know we had an arrangement, but my side business has major issues. I have to skip town. I think I got your switch automated, right? If you get back before the deadline, down with the man. All one word, interesting capitalization. If I get back in time, I'll take care of it personally. You stay safe, triple nine. Then, lying on the floor mat nearby, is an eviction notice. Eviction notice, Grafton Discount Realty. Last and final notice, Flavia Stabo, 809 Main Street, Grafton, West Virginia. That's this pawn shop. Now we know the name of the proprietor of this establishment, Flavia Stabo. But why was she being evicted? Could she not afford to pay rent? Near to this is a third and final note. Flavia's disappearance. Dear Flavia, where are you? The pawn shop has been closed for months. You said you were going away for a while. I keep replaying your farewell dinner and the way you talked. It didn't feel right. Are you okay? Is something wrong? If you need money, I'm sure Robert can give you a loan. You know he was always sweet on you. Everyone's suffering, but you have friends and loved ones that will look after you. Please, just come back. And when you do, for God's sake, clean up. The whole building may be condemned if you don't do something about it. I.F. I.F. Who is I.F.? So, Flavia Stabo, proprietor of the pawn shop in Grafton, closes shop and disappears for months without telling anybody. And she had some sort of strange arrangement with a person who called himself Triple Nine. What did Triple Nine mean by down with the man? And why was it spelled so uniquely? And there's a lot of loot here. Scrap on the shelves, taxidermied heads all over the place, and horns and antlers seemingly around every corner. Against the southern wall by a map, we find a gramophone. We can activate it, and the device does start playing a record, but we don't hear any music. The map against the wall doesn't appear to be very interesting. We don't find any pushpins or other markings. There is nothing of interest behind the counter, though we do find three fish mounted on the wall. Hopefully they're not the singing variety. Opening a door on the eastern wall leads to the pawn shop office. There is yet another set of mounted antlers, this one on the ground, and next to it, a skill level one locked floor safe with a variety of goods inside. Heading out and moving south, we find another door in the eastern wall, this one with two sets of mounted antlers against the wall with a clock above the door. There is a bird cage and a ruined display case just outside, and opening the door, we find a staircase leading up. Before going upstairs, I wanted to finish exploring down here. Back to the hallway, we find dumbbells and scrap on a shelf, and turning around, we open a door into a small workshop. Perhaps this is where Flavia restored some of her secondhand goods before putting them up for sale. Here we find a tinkerer's workbench, which is already useful. We've accumulated quite a lot of scrap, and that's it for the workshop. Heading back to the hallway, we can move south and open the final door to the bathroom. Here we find a number of posters and glowing fungus growing out of the toilet. There's a blood pack in the sink, and that's it for the bathroom. This leaves one path to explore. Heading through the doorway next to the birdcage, we can explore behind the stairs. There is a wooden crate here and just a bunch more scrap. After looting the brain fungus on the walls, we can take the stairs to the top floor. We arrive in a huge room filled with shelves covered in cardboard boxes. What a mess! 
The couches are covered in cardboard boxes. The holotape player also covered in boxes. The table absolutely filthy, covered in more boxes. The kitchen counter by the sink, covered in boxes. What was Flavia doing in this room? Moving south, we see a lower recess. We'll head down there in a sec. But on this level, we find another storage room. More cardboard boxes lining every wall. Blasted out terminals, disassembled filing cabinets, and a big red power cord snaking along the floor. The room next to this one is a small bathroom, but it's essentially empty. So turning around, we can head down a short staircase to explore this lower recess. The room is filled with boxes. In the corner, we see a dirty mattress with a dirty blanket lying on the ground, likely where Flavia slept. There is a single chair in the middle of the room, and it stands right before a chalkboard. Materials, transport, cover-up, location, treasure. So Flavia was investigating something. This explains the cardboard boxes. It explains the dirty mattress in this room. Could it explain her sudden disappearance? We see a number of boxes on this blackboard as if they were to fit certain pieces of information. It almost looks as if we could fill this in. But fill it in with what? On the table before the blackboard, we find some detective case files and army training graduation papers. But neither of these are the clues we need. The detective case files are reused assets from Fallout 4 found in Valentine's Detective Agency, appearing as miscellaneous items that can be scrapped in our inventory. And the army training graduation papers appear to be a miscellaneous item associated with the main quest to the game, Back to Basic in particular. It also just shows up in the miscellaneous section of our inventory and can be scrapped. So... What now? That's a big blackboard. I want to fill it in, but where do we even begin? We don't know. They don't bother to tell us. There's no miscellaneous quest. No other note lying here. Nothing to point us in the right direction. Guess we just gotta figure it out. Where do we begin? Do we just piece together some story based on the clues we find here in the pawn shop? Maybe all of the horns we found for sale on the shelves downstairs have something to do with horn right. That's it. Maybe we find the answer by exploring the rock hound or one of the other horn right places. Oh no, maybe it's that mounted fish thing we saw on the wall behind the counter. Three fish, three fish sea. Three wolf moon, three wolf, three dog, three dog DJ, DJ radio, radio transmission, KMAX transmission. That's right. This is a clue that is clearly sending us to the KMAX transmission location. Wow, we've got to go there for the next clue, right? No? Thinking in this manner is going to send us round and round in circles consuming an awful lot of our time and not getting us anywhere. Thankfully, data miners have already found the location of all of these clues. Did you know that you needed to be an expert data miner to enjoy and play Fallout 76? I didn't, but I guess it's true. Our first data mined clue sends us to the Charleston Capitol Building, specifically the level 30 plus section of the Capitol Building. Taking the rooftop door is the easiest way. After hacking our way through a horde of ghouls, we can look for Senator Blackwell's office to the south. After picking the door and heading inside, if we face his terminal and then turn immediately around, we find a package for Sam Blackwell lying on his shelf. After opening the package, we get three new notes. The Vigilant Citizen's Note to Blackwell, and the Holland Chase Invoices, number 9021 and 9033. We'll read all of these in just a minute. Let's collect all of our clues first, before we assemble and read them on the blackboard. Next, we travel to the nearby Charleston Herald. Taking the staircase all the way to the top floor, we can enter Editor Overby's office. Then, lying on a cabinet behind his desk, we find a package for Quinn Carter. 
Inside the package, we find the Vigilant Citizen's note to Carter and the way station logs. And I'm all right. <laughs> Plastic thing. Now, both of these destinations so far make a bit of sense. We've got a lady running a pawn shop who's a bit paranoid, putting together a case. Who is she going to talk to? Likely a journalist and maybe a senator already known for believing conspiracy theories. Perhaps we could have figured out that we needed to visit these two locations. The next one, however, makes less sense. We find our next data mined clue at the Silva homestead in the forest. After clearing the house, if we look on the coffee table, we find a package from Madeline de Silva. Inside the package is the Vigilant Citizen's note to Leah de Silva and the Filcher Farm report. The next one is another one I suppose we might have been able to guess. Data mining tells us that the next clue is at Lewisburg inside the Van Lo Taxidermy. We came here for the Lying Low quest. We already know how much Calvin loved his conspiracies. We find the next package lying on the front counter. Package for Calvin Van Lo. Inside, we find the Vigilant Citizen's note to Van Lo. Suspicious death at Harper's Ferry. Suspicious death of Alicia Shea. And the suspicious death of Emmanuel Tillings. Our final data mind clue sends us to the town of Mononga. Heading east down the road into town, we can enter the first building to the left, the police station. And lying on the front desk is a package for Sheriff Darcy. Inside the package is Vigilant Citizen's note to Sheriff Darcy, Shanghai Sally Casino Shootout, Shanghai Sally Chapter Closed, Shanghai Sally Berkeley Springs, and Shanghai Sally Conclusions. Once we've collected all five packages, we can head back to the Grafton Pawn Shop. Running upstairs, we can race to the investigation board and add our missing evidence. One by one, each of the clues appears in the proper place. This is what Flavia was trying to piece together before she mysteriously vanished. But what was it? We'll start by reading materials. In the first one, Vigilant Citizen's note to Blackwell. Dear Senator Blackwell, if you would permit me to say this, even though I do not know you, I recognize a like mind, someone willing to see beyond the facile truths that we are spoon-fed. Know that if you read this, I am dead, killed by agents of the U.S. government intent on keeping a conspiracy secret. As improbable as it may seem, the treasure of Appalachia is not a hoax. It is real, and people have been killed for it. Enclosed is part of my findings. Please, broadcast, publish, and distribute. If the other evidence is also shared, you or someone else may put all the pieces together and achieve the final truth. Yours sincerely, a vigilant citizen. So Flavia, not wanting to name herself, sent out all of these packages under the alias A Vigilant Citizen. Let's see what evidence it was that she sent to Senator Blackwell. In the first, Holland Chase Invoice number 9021, Holland Chase Concrete Company, 893 South Prairie Lane, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, date January 19th, 2073, delivered to Appalachia, Special arrangement. Invoice description. January shipment quantity 8,100 cubic yards. 8,100? That's insane! The red notes in the margin must have been written by Flavia. Unit price, as specced. Note, Supervisor Baldwell must handle this personally. Client wants to extend the shipments by three months. And then Flavia notes... This is not going to Vault 76. They are using another supplier. 8,100 cubic yards of concrete could easily build several bunkers. What is all this concrete being used for? Well, whatever it was being used for, the buyer clearly didn't want to be identified. 
This entire order was being handled by Supervisor Baldwell, and only he knew where to deliver it to. Delivery under special arrangement. In the next one, Holland Chase Invoice number 9033, we see much of the same thing, only this one is dated March 19th, 2073. Here we find an order for 8,300 cubic yards of concrete. Flavia's notes in the margin, do not look for Baldwell. Why? Is he dangerous? Or did she not want to get him in trouble? These are the only invoices I managed to acquire. Public records show Holland Chase won a government contract in 72, but the details of that bid are classified. What is the government building? So the mysterious client is the U.S. government. They were building something big, necessitating all of this concrete. But it wasn't Vault 76, as 76 sourced its concrete from a different supplier. Perhaps Flavia uncovered exactly what it was they were building. Moving on to the next column, Transport. We can read the Vigilant Citizen's note to Carter. Dear Quinn Carter, I have picked these words with care, for if there is someone as doggedly committed to the truth in Appalachia, I do not know her. I am, I suppose was, one of your more ardent fans. And from here, the note repeats itself. Looks like she has boilerplate messages for all of her targets, where she only customized the intro paragraph. Though here, she ends with a personal note, handwritten with red ink. P.S. Time is short. At this juncture, I only trust you. Please go to the Clarksburg Post Office and ask for P.O. Box 999. What? P.O. Box 999? We came here to the Clarksburg Post Office when I did my live stream covering the quest Cold Case. At that time, we found the post office boxes and opened each and every one of them. So now, all of these are empty. There is one that has a screwdriver and a bobby pin inside, and is locked with a skill level 1 lock. But as I had already opened it, there was nothing inside. Frustratingly, there is nothing here that tells us the number of any of these P.O. Boxes, so we don't know which one was P.O. Box 999. However, we do find a clue while examining the Clarksburg Public Records Terminal. At the very end, we find a new option to enter the password down with the man with that unique capitalization. Password for program dead man switch authenticated. Timer zero hour reached zero. Function showtime executed. Packages loaded and post office handies armed. Packages away. Final confirmation received. All packages delivered. Command? We can try open timer zero hour, only to learn that the timer is locked by admin and cannot be modified. Then we can try to open the function show time, but this function is also locked by the admin. Header access only. Suck it, coppers. Header ends. Finally, we can open procedure Packages. Packages has 11 sub-procedures. All sub-procedures locked by admin. This tells us how Flavia delivered the packages. She thought she had solved this case, and so she left to see if her discovery was accurate. But this trip was dangerous. She could be killed. And to prevent all of the knowledge she had uncovered from dying with her, she gathered up all of the clues from her investigation board, packaged them in five different envelopes, and then took them here to the Clarksburg post office and put them in box 999. But she didn't want to give this information to all of these people unless it was absolutely necessary. This was her last resort. And so she worked with a friend to set up an automated program on this computer which they called a switch. If this friend or Flavia didn't return to the Clarksburg post office before a specific time, the switch would flip. The specific time was zero hour. The switch was showtime. 
And once the switch was flipped, 11 armed Protectron postal couriers were dispatched to deliver the contents of P.O. Box 999 to the designated recipients. The question we have now is what happened to the other six postal courier Protectrons? After all, we've only found five packages so far, and yet the terminal said that there were 11. We're missing six. Perhaps we'll find them later. Flavia never came back. Her associate, as we read, had to skip town. No one made it back to the Clarksburg post office before the zero hour. And so the switch was flipped. Back at the pawn shop and still under transport, we can read the next clue, the way station logs. Morgantown Way Station. Daily auto ticket logs. Number one... 217 in the morning, an overage of 29,120 pounds, fine, $31,000, status, admin override. The next day, at 226 in the morning, it records an overage of 28,830 pounds, generating a fine of $30,000, but again, this one was dismissed with an admin override. The next day, at 3.03 in the morning, it read an overage of 35,110 pounds, generating a fine of $42,000. This one also dismissed with an admin override. These three stand out as suspicious, but the rest appear to be innocuous. Number four happened at 11.01 in the morning. The overage was only 1,010 pounds, generating a $10,000 fine, and it was paid in full. On the next day, at 2.01 in the afternoon, it registers an overage of only three pounds, which also generated a fine of $10,000. Holy cow. All right, looks like the Morgantown Way Station had a base default fine of $10,000 for any overage. That's crazy. This one was sent to collections. And the next one, at 7.08 in the evening, it recorded an overage of only 831 pounds. Again, a $10,000 fine. This was paid by an account already on file. And the final one, at 9.13 at night, it recorded an overage of 303 pounds, again generating a $10,000 fine. The police were called, but it was then paid in full. So all of these appeared to be fines to everyday citizens. Hauling goods, hauling machinery, going about their daily lives. But those top three were exceptional. Huge overages, generating a ton of money, and all three were dismissed by an admin override. And Flavia noticed the same thing. At the very bottom, she wrote with her hand, late night shipments of extreme amount of goods? Waived fines? I interviewed the sole attendant at the way station, and he didn't even know there was an admin. Someone very connected is trying to make this go away. Could this be a record of all of the concrete the government was having delivered? There is a photograph associated with this way station log, but we can't examine it. The only way to see it is to hop into photo mode. It was taken at 2.30 in the morning, right about the same time as all of those other overweight deliveries, and it appears to be a delivery truck turning off the road. It only has two shipping crates on its bed. What could be inside that weighs 35,000 pounds? Next, we move on to cover-up. We begin with the Vigilant Citizen's note to Van Lowe. Dear Calvin Van Lowe, To be frank, I hesitate to send this to you, but I am desperate, and from what I've heard, you and your friends are relentless about digging into the truth despite what society may say. I beg you to hear me out. And then she repeats herself. So we can move on to the suspicious deaths overview. Number one. The work foreman was Antonio Childs, one of the more capable and respected builders in the area. He quit his job at Sunnyfield Construction two years ago. Then he went away for weeks at a time and came back with a great deal of cash. His new house is one of the biggest in Harper's Ferry. The neighbors had a host of suspicions about him. Was he a bank robber? A cat burglar? 
His closest friend and drinking companion said Antonio confided he found a nice, cushy government contract, and he was skimming some money on the side. Number 2. Mr. Tillings was killed three days after my interview with him when a truck smashed into the way station where he worked. The driver of the truck has been identified as Mr. John Doe. Mr. Doe claims to have lost control of the vehicle, but managed to bail out just before the impact. After being held for observation at Morgantown General, Mr. Doe was discharged. There is no subsequent record of his stay. Whatever additional evidence Mr. Tillings was going to provide is now lost. This Mr. Tillings must have been the way station worker Flavia interviewed about the way station logs we read. Number three. I talked with Paige Rockwell and she said the timing of Mrs. Shea's death was suspicious. Mrs. Shea was close to sending the Herald a bombshell. I managed to enter Shea's home four nights after the incident. There was ample evidence of a struggle and clearly the whole place had been thoroughly searched. The government was looking for something, and I fear they found it and silenced her. Conclusion So three suspicious deaths. How is this a conspiracy, you may ask? I have sent my proof to several sources. You are just one. I fear your package is the least effective on its own, but if it is put together with the others, then a clear pattern emerges. As I have investigated this conspiracy, the number of people that have moved suddenly, stopped returning my calls abruptly, met with accidents, or simply disappeared is alarming. These are just the three most obvious. Mr. Van Lowe, please share this with anyone willing to believe. So three of the people that Flavia had talked with while collecting all of the evidence on this board are dead. We read what the way station worker had to say already. Perhaps the other two will appear later. This one also came with a photograph, but the photograph isn't very interesting. It's just a skeletonized body leaning against a tree. Beneath this, we find three more items. First, the suspicious death at Harper's Ferry. This is the contractor with the cushy government contract. Man skull fractured and robbery near Harper's Ferry train yard by Luke Hogan. A 42-year-old foreman was fatally injured when a group of three men attacked and robbed him by the Harpers Ferry train yard last night, authorities said. The police responded at 1.32 a.m. to an anonymous call and discovered that the victim was already dead. Detectives determined he was jumped from behind and was hit repeatedly with a large blunt object. This is the first incident of its kind since the curfew was lifted after the clay riot last Thursday. There is no word from the mayor if the curfew will be reenacted. So a foreman lands a cushy government job, but then begins skimming from the top, starts bragging about it to his friends, and then he dies. Coincidence? In the next one, suspicious death of Alicia Shea, local woman commits suicide, neighborhood in mourning, by Paige Rockwell. Alicia Shea of Berkeley Springs was found dead in her bathroom by her daughter of 13 on Sunday. The police claim it was suicide. Mrs. Shea was a tireless advocate of the community and local unions. She led several anti-automation protests. She published several exposés in our newspaper. She was a true leader of her community. The mood in Berkeley Springs is one of anguish and outrage. One anonymous neighbor said, Alicia was done in. Last night, several homes were broken in. You could hear yelling. When the investigator was asked about the evidence, he said that the case was closed. It's suicide, plain and simple. A protest leader and union supporter commits suicide in her bathroom? Doesn't sit right with me. And in the final one, suspicious death of Emmanuel Tillings. Obituaries. Emmanuel Tillings, Morgantown. The wife and children of Emmanuel Tillings express profound sorrow at the passing of their beloved husband and father. A tireless government worker, he always had a friendly smile to all truckers passing through Morgantown. Though the way station has now been closed, we are collecting donations to erect a small monument for him at the site. He will be missed. Moving on to location, we can start with Vigilant Citizen's Note to Leah De Silva. 
Madeline, send this directly to Leah. Don't get involved. Dear Leah Da Silva, we have never met, but your abuela speaks of nothing else. I feel I know you. You are a woman of honor. That the oaths you swore when joining the army were more than words. I hope with your rank you have resources to investigate American lives being at risk on American soil. And from here it repeats. Now that we know that Leah was a member of the army, I think we can deduce that the Silva homestead is likely where Hannah De Silva, member of the Brotherhood of Steel, grew up. She played a prominent role in the founding of the Appalachian chapter of the Brotherhood of Steel as an original member of Taggarty's Thunder. We talked a lot about her in my video on the Brotherhood of Steel and Appalachia that you can watch here. Leah and Madeline here must have been family members, maybe a mother, sister, aunt. This package is the only one that came with a holotape. We can listen to Filcher Farm interview in our inventory. This is a vigilant citizen, and this is an interview with Gladys Filcher. Uh, can you repeat that? So those soldiers, they drove onto my land and started fencing off the north part of my farm two years back. Well, I ain't one to take that line down. After making a ruckus, their captain came by, said it was for my own safety, that there were dangerous levels of radiation over there. Did they say what caused it? They wouldn't say word one. Before I could carry on too much, this man in a black suit comes over, says it's eminent domain, and he gives me this check with more zeros in it than I've ever seen. And did you take it? Damn right I did. These are hard times. Everyone else I know took the deal, too. We was told to keep it quiet, not to create a needless panic. Do you ever see any evidence of the radiation? This is off the record, like you said, right? Absolutely. You have my word. Huh. Well, that's just it. I never saw any signs of anything dangerous. I got a couple of cows that like grazing that away. After the fence, I chased the cows off. But the damn animals always went back. Third time I caught them. I gave up. I figured they were goners anyhow. So there's no evidence of anything suspicious? No. Truth be told, I almost forgot about it. Except for the noise. Noise? Yeah. You could hear trucks coming and going every now and then. At the damnedest hours, too. A couple of times I heard a train whistle, too. But that's about it. Next, we can read the Filcher Farm Report. Dear Leah, the interview I did with Gladys Filcher is only part of the story. I followed the fencing for approximately three miles before I saw a military jeep approaching in the distance. I couldn't see anything from the fence line. Despite numerous radioactive hazard signs, my Geiger counter did not register anything beyond normal background levels of radiation. Even a minor nuclear accident would register at least something for a massive distance from its source. The upshot is that there clearly was no radioactive accident in that vicinity. So what was the military doing there? Why was so much land being cordoned off? What were the trucks doing that Mrs. Filcher reported late at night? Please use your military contacts to investigate and anonymously publish your findings. If everyone does what they are supposed to, the evidence will be undeniable. Sincerely, F.S. Because she already felt like she knew Leah through her relationship with Leah Zabuela, she didn't sign it a vigilant citizen, she signed it F.S. Flavia Stabo. This is our clearest indication yet that the owner of this pawn shop, the woman who worked here, is the same person who put together all of these clues and used the automated switch inside the Clarksburg post office to send all of these packages around Appalachia. There is a picture here as well, and it doesn't tell us anything we don't already know. It's a picture of fenced off land with a radioactive sign on it, which was a red herring. 
as Flavia proved there was no radioactivity in the area. Next, we can move on to treasure. In Vigilant Citizen's note to Sheriff Darcy, Dear Sheriff Scott Darcy, I have followed your career with interest. You broke several notable cases in Charleston, and even when facing disciplinary hearings, you stood up for the truth. I hesitate to send you into harm's way again, but this is bigger than both of us. And here she repeats herself again. Moving down, we can read Shanghai Sally Conclusions. Doing research on the conspiracy in Berkeley Springs, I came across their own connection to Shanghai Sally. Sally was a summer news sensation, so I had heard of her, of course, but locals identifying her as Catherine Montgomery made me curious. The more I researched, the more oddities I found. Rutkowski reportedly went back east to deal with a family emergency the day after he gave testimony to the police. He has not been heard from since. This, despite his many close friends trying to find him. There are absolutely no records that a Catherine Montgomery ever existed, yet almost a dozen people claim to know her very well and recall her chumming around with other off-duty military personnel. Several other soldiers, regulars of bars and houses of ill repute, went missing around the same time frame. Two of the Ultralux mobsters look very similar to those missing soldiers. But given the number of bullet wounds on the face and bodies, it's hard to make a positive ID. The streets of Berkeley Springs have more army MPs on them than a military base. They've been here so long that the citizens don't even recognize how strange that is. So connecting the dots and posing a theory, Shanghai Sally is Catherine Montgomery. She and several accomplices somehow made over $20 million and went to Las Vegas. Then the government found them and used any means necessary to silence them permanently. I can feel it in my bones. The treasure of Appalachia is real. Montgomery found it and died because of it. Ultra Lux? Las Vegas? Moving down, we can read Shanghai Sally, Berkeley Springs. Berkeley Springs Police Report. Case closed. Date July 15th, 2072. Reporting Officer R. Miles. Detail of event. C. Rutkowski came into the precinct at around 9 a.m. He had the Charleston Herald article about Shanghai Sally. He said that the woman in the picture wasn't Sally Smith. Instead, it was Catherine Montgomery, a U.S. Army sergeant. Rutkowski said that Montgomery had been missing for three weeks. They were apparently in a relationship. Before the interview was concluded, two other people, D. Whitby and J. Seymour, came in claiming they knew Shanghai Sally's real identity as well. My partner and I went to interview some soldiers on R&R &R at Mike's. They indicated Montgomery was in charge of the motor pool, and they recognized her from one of Rutkowski's photos. When I showed them the Herald with the picture of Shanghai Sally, their demeanor changed, and they excused themselves quickly. Actions taken. Notes were gathered from this, and the chief said they would be passed along to the FBI. They've claimed jurisdiction. We were told it must be a look-alike. Apparently, it's pretty common in high-profile cases. The resemblance, though, is truly remarkable. Summary. All notes, records, and testimony has been boxed and sent by military courier to the FBI. In the next one, Shanghai Sally, Casino Shootout, Charleston, Thursday morning, July 14th, 2072. Five slain in mob shootout at the Ultra Lux by Luke Hogan. In a dramatic scene on Wednesday night, police stormed the Ultra Lux Casino in Las Vegas and engaged in a protracted battle with mobsters. Hundreds of bullets were fired, all mobsters were slain, and 17 bystanders were injured. Interviews with eyewitnesses indicate complete chaos and contradictory stories. Some witnesses report the mobsters tried to surrender twice. One eyewitness claims the firefight started with a sniper round, killing one of the mobsters. A cashier claimed the mobsters were winning until soldiers arrived and used a missile launcher to blow two of them up. The chief of police claimed this as a major victory. It's time for us to send a clear message that no one in Las Vegas is above the law.
And finally, we can read Shanghai Sally, Chapter Closed. Charleston, Sunday evening, July 17th, 2072. Shanghai Sally's reign of terror ends by Norman Pennywise. Vertebrates still circle the piers in Galveston, hovering over the charred remains of the getaway boat the U.S. Navy barraged Sunday afternoon, thus ending the crime spree of one of the most notorious Chinese spies in U.S. history, Shanghai Sally. Although it seems like a lifetime ago, Shanghai Sally was only identified on Thursday, Initially, Shanghai Sally was discovered barricaded in one of the high roller suites in the Lucky 38 in Las Vegas with over $20 million in cash stuffed into several duffel bags. Before she could be apprehended, she allegedly used bed sheets to climb down to the ground floor. In the four days that followed, reports of Shanghai Sally eluding police came in hour by hour as she made her way east. She was sighted in Flagstaff, Albuquerque, and El Paso while carjacking vehicles from innocents. One unconfirmed report indicates she even infiltrated a U.S. Army base and stole a fully armed vertebrate. Early Sunday morning, Shanghai Sally was identified by a Red Rocket gas attendant in Galveston. As she sped off to meet her Chinese handlers in a stolen speedboat, the USS Wade barraged the boat with salvos of heavy ordnance, dramatically closing this terrifying chapter. What do we make of this story? A U.S. Army service member named Catherine Montgomery steals $20 million from the U.S. government with a bunch of her friends in the service. Then, she ditches her fiancé, Rutkowski, and travels with her accomplices all the way to Las Vegas, where she lives it up at the Lucky 38 in the nearby casinos. But the government tracks her there, and most of her accomplices die in a shootout at the Ultralux, whereupon the government covers it up as an assault on the mob, even going as far as to dress up those accomplices as Ultralux mobsters. But Catherine Montgomery escapes and hijacks vehicles all the way to Galveston, Texas before she's killed by the U.S. Navy. The government nicknames her Shanghai Sally and says that she was a Chinese spy, then scrubs any record of Catherine Montgomery from any publicly available database, even getting rid of her fiancé once it became known that he recognized her. Why would they do this over $20 million? What does this $20 million have to do with the concrete shipments? The strange construction taking place near Filcher Farm? How are these related? $20 million isn't exactly a lot of money in the Fallout universe, as demonstrated by the ridiculous way station fines. It might have been a lot of money to Catherine Montgomery, but to the United States government? To stage a shootout in Las Vegas, get the U.S. Navy involved, and then initiate this massive cover-up? They probably spent more than $20 million on the munitions used against her. And how did she get her hands on the money? Does it have something to do with her being in charge of the motor pool? But how would that job grant her access to $20 million? I think there's more to this story. I don't think the money can really explain it. It certainly doesn't explain the government's extreme response. I took a couple steps back to take a screenshot of the investigation board, but as I crouched down, I discovered that this light is a black light. Flipping the switch. Okay. We find six words written on the wall with invisible ink. Gas man, spelunker, teach, the meat, halo, and cryptid. Beneath the words is a corkboard. And then we remember the terminal at the Clarksburg post office said that the Protectrons had delivered 11 packages. And so far we've only found five. We are missing six, but on this wall are six words. These six words must be clues that lead to the final six packages that Flavia delivered. And it looks like we can organize these new clues on this corkboard. Thankfully, this time, they actually give us some clues. Though, even these clues just aren't very good. The first one is a decent clue. Gas Man. Gas Man. Well, what does that conjure up? Conjures up a gas station. 
So, Red Rocket. But which Red Rocket? There are, after all, many of them. We can go with the biggest Red Rocket. Heading to the Red Rocket Mega Stop, if we move to the smaller shop in the southeastern section of the Mega Shop, we find a mysterious map fragment, Barry, located on one of the countertops by a radio. Inside this package is an unmarked map fragment. It has a small note attached. Urgent. Barry, take this to my shop. Find all of the pieces. F.S. Flavia Stabo. Great, one down, five to go. Next, Spelunker. Oh, another easy one, Spelunker. Cave Spelunking. Which cave? Well, probably the Uncanny Caverns. Sure enough, heading to the Uncanny Caverns, if we head through the gift shop, on the front desk, near to the radio, we find Mysterious Map Fragment, Constance. After looting it, we get the same pop-up message. Only this time, instead of being addressed to Barry, it's addressed to Constance. Next is Teach. Oh, God. Well, what could she have meant by Teach? Teacher? Where do children go to be taught? A school. Okay, so we'll find this at a school. But which school? Well, if you guessed Watoga High, you'll sadly be spending many frustrated hours searching in vain. The correct answer is the Morgantown High School. We find the next package on the second floor of the Morgantown High School on a desk in one of the classrooms. It's the classroom with the Halloween decorations on the wall and the partially broken floor. Here we find mysterious map fragment, Wren. The next clue is the meat. Another awful, awful clue. Remember, Flavia wrote this before the war, so we can't consider anything in Appalachia that would have appeared after it, so the meat won't have anything to do with the Gormons Raiders or Toxic Larry's Meat and Go, which I'm presuming was a post-war meat-selling shack. After all, who would name their business Toxic Larry's before the war? At any rate, what we're looking for is a restaurant. A restaurant serves the meat. And the correct restaurant is the General's Steakhouse. If we go through the front door and then round the corner to pass through the door to the General's Dining Hall, we find the next package on the countertop near to the register. This is Mysterious Map Fragment, Finn. Next is Halo. Now, if this clue made you think about what may or may not be hanging from the corner of your girlfriend's four-post bed, then you're clearly old. Instead, this clue is supposed to conjure up the image of a church. Which church? We're just gonna have to guess. Is it the Charleston Church? The Helvetia Church? The Flatwoods Church? No, none of the above. The correct guess is Haven Church. If we head through the front door, we find it on the reception counter. Mysterious map fragment, Jessica. And the final clue is Cryptid. Another clue that could be interpreted a myriad of ways, but this one I think is pretty obvious. We need to head to the Mothman Museum inside Point Pleasant. And if we do, we find the next mysterious map fragment on the front desk countertop next to the cash register, mysterious map fragment, Fernando. With all the map fragments collected, we can head back to the pod shop and move to the cork board. When ready, we can add map fragment. Oh, awful timing. Nothing like giant event notifications about events I'm not even participating in. Completely ruining the moment. Thanks, Mayor. We see that once all six map fragments are together, we begin to recognize this landscape, and one point on the map is marked with an X. Taking a look at our map, we can try to match up some of the details, and it's a little tricky. The map we have doesn't have all of the same rivers, or at least they're not as prominent. This map must have been an elevation map. The dark part of the map is not water, it denotes lower elevation. We see a distinctive lake in the bottom number six that leads to a river flowing south. And if we match that up with our map, we see that it's the lake right next to Thunder Mountain. So the dark area on the map must be the mire and the lighter area must be the Savage Divide. 
we see a darkened loop on the number 9 tile, which corresponds to a road on our map that goes around a large bluff. This is close to the X on the map, which means that the closest marked location to this X is the Bailey family cabin. We can go ahead and make our own custom destination roundabouts where we think that X is. Fast traveling to the Bailey family cabin, we can head northeast towards our custom destination, and we find that our destination ends right at the edge of a mountain. We find ourselves amongst a pile of flattened rocks. It's just a matter of running around here to see if we can find anything of interest, because there's no beeping sound to follow, no quest marker to follow, no other indication aside from that map, which we can't pick up and take with us, which we have to leave back at the pawn shop. Eventually, if we're lucky, we find a cave. All right, this must be it. But no, it's not. This is the wrong cave. The cave we want is actually directly above this one. Hopping up a few steps, directly above this cave, we find a different cave covered in vegetation with bright glowing fungus. Here's the exact location on the map. Heading inside this cave, we see a puddle of water on the ground, rocks to the right, vines hanging from the ceiling, and rust. Where there's rust, there's metal. We see that the northern wall of this cave is a wall of concrete, and in this wall is a keypad. Now, on her map, Flavia had written six numbers. These six numbers must make up our pass key. And note that these six numbers are different for every player. If you try to use my numbers, it won't work for your game. You have to go and get all six map fragments on your own. But my pass key was 896416. A door slides open. We find a force field grid that was red, but with the pass key in hand, it turns blue. Moving towards the force field, a door slides open. We're in an elevator. We can punch the button inside the elevator to reach Vault 79? We arrive in Vault 79. Stepping out of the elevator, whoa. This is one huge chamber. Turning around, we can look at this elevator. There's a locked door next to this elevator, locked with a skill level two lock. After picking it, we don't find much. There's a bunch of scrap in here and a number of boxes, all of which are just filled with more scrap. This room is filled with earth-moving equipment and all sorts of vehicles. There's a porta potty next to us to the southwest. Nothing inside. Continuing southwest, we see a road leading out. Ventilation pipes snake in and out of the road. These appear to all be broken, and the road itself is caved in with rubble. Was this done purposefully, or is it the result of the bombs? Moving out, we see a platform to the southeast, but we can't get there from here. Hopping atop the bulldozer, we can look around. We see that the platform has a number of boxes connected to another platform filled with shelves covered in more boxes. Looks like the way we need to get up there is to the north. Hopping down, we can move north, and here we pass a trailer. Inside the trailer, we see that it was a bit of a security office, blasting out terminals and a bunch of scrap. No lore, nothing of interest. Moving towards the staircase, we see a skeleton lying in what at one time was a shallow grave, but the earth has all moved away to expose the skeleton. If we examine the skeleton, the skeletal structure looks to be that of a female. There also appears to be a large fracture at the base of the skull, which is surrounded by gunpowder residue. This must be the remains of Flavia Stabo. She found it. She made it all the way here, only to be apprehended, forced to her knees, and then executed by gunshot to the back of the head. She died here, which is why she never returned to her pawn shop 
which is why her friends were looking for her so many months later, which is why the automated program switched, sending out her messages to people of prominence in Appalachia. What were they hiding? Why did Flavia have to die? Heading up the stairs, we find the door to Vault 79. This explains the shipments of concrete. It explains all of the vehicles moving in and out of the farm late at night and all of the sounds of construction. But how can this explain the $20 million? How does it explain Shanghai's Sally? Are the two even connected? Maybe Flavia was wrong about that connection. But then again, here she lies dead, executed. Why would the government execute Flavia simply for discovering the location of Vault 79? Especially when other vaults they didn't even attempt to hide. Vault 76, the door of which stands loud and proud overlooking Appalachia. Vaults 94, 96, 63, and 51, none of which are exactly difficult to find. But this one, hidden in a cave behind a laser grid, behind a concrete door, behind a passcode, at the bottom of an elevator. What is it about Vault 79 that the government was trying to hide? At the end of this platform, we find a small staircase leading up to a metal landing. Here we find consoles and boxes, and on one table, a still functioning terminal. The Vault 79 Entrance Terminal. Warning, U.S. official personnel only. We find three options in the first, operational security. It is imperative that all external facing terminals are wiped and restored to default settings every day. No exceptions. All of us know what we are protecting, so do your job. Remember this, any and all intruders are to be considered hostile agents. Treat them accordingly. So that's why Flavia had to die. At the end of each shift, package all daily logs and deliver them to the officer of the watch. Activate the contingency plan immediately when ordered. You know the drill. Stay out of sight. No smoking up top. Use the designated smoking area. In the next one, log October 23rd, 2077, 103 in the morning. Relieved the previous shift. Patrolled the exterior. It's dark and quiet. Not too cold. Saw an owl hunting. Beautiful creature. Looks like it may be a peach of a day come sun up. In the next one, October 23rd, 2077, 3.57 in the morning. Grace caught some calm traffic from the United States Air Force. I don't like the sound of it. Having everyone start prepping the SOP just in case. Probably jumping at shadows, but hey... Even if nothing happens, it relieves the boredom. October 23rd, 2077. The day the bombs dropped. The security team here at Vault 79 initiated their contingency plan, and whatever it was never allowed them to come back topside to delete these logs from this terminal, which is what they are supposed to do at the end of each shift. Instead, these have sat here for 25 years, which means that the day the bombs dropped, these people went deep inside and never returned. What is in Vault 79? What is it these people, in their words, were protecting? Are they still alive? Why was this vault, of all vaults, kept such a secret? We sadly don't know. But perhaps soon we'll learn. And that's the full story of the mystery of the Grafton Pawn Shop. What are your thoughts about this little adventure? I am torn. I loved it. And I hated it. I loved all of the effort that went into each and every note. I loved the mystery, the intrigue, the corruption, the conspiracy. I hate it the way we had to find it and assemble it. I don't know why Bethesda is doing this with a lot of their new content for Fallout 76. No quests, no miscellaneous quests, no quest markers, no map markers, not even notes and holotapes left behind to nudge us in the right direction. 
one could argue that the way we find this content is the way we would find this content in the world. And you're right. Flavia is not going to go around leaving clues as to where she sent her packages. So this is more realistic. That is a fair point. But it's also supposed to be a game. And I can't imagine a player being anything but infinitely frustrated to walk into the pawn shop to see the investigation board and how empty it is. And to realize that there's evidence out there that we can collect to fill this up to tell the story. But aside from data mining or stumbling upon the data other people have mined, we're just not going to find this stuff but by chance. That's annoying. And that's got to change. Still, the story itself is really fun. The mystery and detective work is part of why I like playing this game. I am now adequately pumped up to find out what's inside Vault 79. I just hope it's not a raid dungeon. But those are just my thoughts, ladies and gentlemen. What have you got to think? Let me know in the comments section below. I publish many Fallout videos each and every week here on my channel, so if you don't want to miss my next episode, be sure to subscribe and to click that bell notification button. If you have and you still feel like you're missing out on YouTube notifications, consider following me on Twitter at Oxhorn. I update Twitter manually with every new piece of content that I publish. I've got a shirt in the shop. Enclave. Declare your support for the Enclave and everything they stand for with this brand new design that comes on shirts in a variety of men's, women's, and children's sizes. You can find it on other products as well, like smartphone cases, pillows, posters, mugs, stickers, prints, etc. So if interested, you can find a link to my shop in the description below, or you can click here. If you like what I do and you want to support me in a more personal way, consider becoming a patron on Patreon or a member here on YouTube. But more than anything, I'm just so glad you're here watching this video with me today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you soon with more brand new videos.